Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, Justin. <clears throat> yeah, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a relatively new uh, assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering here. I've been here just a little over a year. <clears throat> I did my undergrad degree here, though, so I have Oklahoma roots. Uh, I went to graduate school at UT Austin, uh, and I worked for a few years in between my master's degree and my PhD in wastewater treatment. Worked both uh, some industrial work and on the municipal side. And, uh, the last four years before I came here, I was working at Argonne National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy uh, federally funded research and development center, studying the whole U.S. energy system, how the water and energy interact. And so this is this is one example of water energy uh, interactions, and it's a very important one in this state, obviously, uh, produced water management. So uh, it's something I'm really interested in. It kind of touches back into my wastewater background now, too. So it's something I'm really interested in trying to get more involved with. Uh, so just to sort of overview what I was going to talk to you about today is give you a little bit of background on oil and gas production because I don't exactly know what everybody's background is, but just a real uh, basic intro on what how oil and gas production works, uh, what the environmental impacts of oil and gas production are, uh, and some of the challenges that are associated with trying to reuse the produced water, uh, and then just a little bit about produced water treatment technologies that are out there, uh, research opportunities. So. So yeah, the first question that comes to mind and looking at this issue is what is what is produced water? What does that actually mean? Uh, it's a term that's used uh, by the oil and you know people in the oil and gas industry to describe the wastewater. So uh, you know, as human beings, one of the things that we like to do to make our our lives better is to uh, go and dig things out of the ground. And one example of that is with energy resources like oil and gas. So the process of getting that out of the ground requires us to take water into these sites and, and use it. At the same time, you've got water that's already down there underground with the oil and gas formation. So uh, produced water is a, basically uh, represents any sort of water that comes out of the ground along with the oil and gas. And that water has a tendency to be salty. You go far enough underground, the water uh, starts to get salty. So what comes out of the ground, it could be some mixture of what comes into the site that's used in the extraction process. Uh, and also what is in the formation beforehand. Um, and so, right, so you have wastewater that comes from the oil and gas operations, and you also have water that was just down there with the oil and gas. And produced water is a catch-all term for just anything that comes out, out of the ground, that comes up to the surface along with an oil and gas well. Um, okay, so I, you know, just a really, wasn't sure exactly what sort of background everybody has here, but you think about oil and gas, uh, tend to be formed in places that used to be uh, used to be underwater, and so light energy comes from the sun that gets captured by plants and photosynthesis, and so we can kind of think of all our fossil fossil energy resources as sort of stored solar energy that accumulated over millions of years. Uh, and so, with oil and gas in places that used to be underwater, you have plants and, and other organisms that used to be underwater and they died and they settled to the bottom of the ocean. And over time, <clears throat> that organic matter is transformed um, by biogeochemical processes, uh, buried deep under, um, under sand and silt at deposits there, uh, and eventually it forms these oil and gas deposits that uh, also require a lot of high temperature and high pressure deep underground. So that's where the oil and gas comes from. So at one point in time, there was a lot of salt water that was in contact with this carbon, and so that tends to be that oil and gas are co-located with uh, salt water now. Okay, so so what does this look like? Uh, sort of a higher level, thinking about getting oil and gas out of the ground. Uh, within a formation, you have some sort of reservoir rock where the oil and gas are formed, and that's that's deep underground. And what happens is, uh, because oil and gas are lighter than water, they have a tendency to rise up higher. And uh, in situations where you have a uh, impermeable layer, that oil and gas will eventually reach a point where it can't go any further. And in those areas, that's where you get concentrated locations of oil and gas. So within a given formation, you have the oil that's formed at one place and tends to rise up higher. Um, but the reality, of course, is that this is all mixed together in some, in some level. So you're going to have a lot of salt water, you're going to have oil and gas, all those things are going to be located together. And in conventional uh, situations, you have some sort of uh, impermeable layer that stops this from moving up further. And so this is, these are the concentrated areas. These are the places where it's easy to get oil out of the ground. 
Um, so the way, that, the way that it's typically done uh, is you drill a well down like it showed in the last diagram. And um, the area, uh, the formations tend to be under pressure initially. So at the beginning, you poke a hole in this formation and the oil and gas comes out really easily. Uh, you don't tend to get a lot of water at the beginning that you will have to use. So this is a diagram showing the sort of life cycle of one theoretical um, well. And so at the beginning, you're going to have some exploration and development. You need water for drilling. So you're going to bring some water in. Uh, you know, recently, we have the hydraulic fracturing process. So you may bring that in at the beginning before you get anything out. So you poke a hole, and you eventually, at the beginning, you're going to start getting oil and gas out because it's all under pressure without having to do anything. Over time, the pressure is going to fall and within a formation, and so you have to have some way to get the oil to the wellhead to get it up out of the ground. So a lot of times um, at sites, they'll start injecting water. So at the beginning, you have to bring some water in to the site to keep the reservoir under pressure uh, to, in order to be able to get the, the oil out of the ground. Uh, after a while, the amount, the easy, the low-hanging fruit from a formation will <clears throat> will be captured, and you're going to start to get more salt water. And so this is just sort of a graph showing you have to bring some water in at the beginning, and then after a while, you're going to start getting more and more salt water that comes out of the out of the formation along with the oil and gas. So so this is the the initial stages where you don't need to bring any water in. You start injecting water, and you're going to get some production. Over time, you get more and more produced water that comes out of these wells. Uh, and then eventually that's going to decline, and that's when they'll stop, uh, stop the oil and gas operations. Now, sometimes places will have an additional process where they might use some other chemical to try to liberate the oil and get that out of ground. And that's all this is trying to show. So, so primary recovery is the beginning when the reservoir is under pressure, and that tends to be only a small part of the total amount of oil that comes out. Secondary recovery is when you have water injection, and then you may have some enhanced recovery after that. So, um, so hydraulic fracturing... Uh, is a relatively, I guess it's a technology that's been around, but it's recently become more uh, economical. And the idea is that um, the underlying source rock tends to be lower permeability, and so you can't get the oil to come out of there very easily. So, um, so with fracturing, what you do is you put the water underground under high pressure, and that creates those fractures that then facilitate the movement of the oil from the underlying source rock to these different wells. Uh, and they tend to use some sand in there because sand is relatively uh, high permeability. So you inject sand to sort of fill those voids so that you can get the oil and gas out. Uh, and so lots of water gets used in that process. But when you look at it over the life cycle of the whole well, it tends to not be so much. So you need a lot when you do the fracking, but then you get oil uh, coming out of, ground, out of the ground for a long time. So it ends up not being necessarily a whole lot when you look at it over the life cycle of the whole well. Uh, and so sometimes the, the new technology is called unconventional recovery. So I talked to you a little bit about conventional recovery where you have some sort of migration up into a, an area where, uh, where the permeability is high and you can get it out. The underlying shale where a lot of this oil and gas is produced, that's, that's going deeper underground and that's going to be a different extraction process. And so that's often called unconventional oil and gas. So that's the difference between... Uh, the shale oil and shale gas, and, um, and the conventional processes that we've been using over the last hundred years. Uh, the, way, the reason that this has become economical is because of the hydraulic fracturing and also because of these horizontal wells. So drilling a well costs a lot of money. Uh, it's expensive. But so if you can drill once and then send it through the source rock in a horizontal way, it allows you to, to do the operation a lot more economically. Okay, and so as a result of these new technologies where they can uh, do the horizontal drilling, that's one of the reasons we've seen this new boom. And so this is just a su summary of uh, oil and gas production. Uh, so again, the, the tide oil and the shale gas that you, you see there are basically re responsible for our recent increase in production. Along with that new oil and gas, guess what? We get lots more produced water than we used to have. Um, and you know, I just have a little summary here. So natural gas, natural gas is everywhere. It's produced naturally by uh, organisms at the surface. It also gets produced in places where you have coal. It also gets produced along with the oil. And there are some places where there are wells dedicated just to getting uh, the gas out of the ground. So this is sort of a summary of all that. But you can see what's been driving the recent boom is this shale gas that, that is shown here. 